I mean, what's fascinating to me is that it wasn't set out to be a trilogy, and it kind of organically grew. Well, this was back in the quaint old days when, <laughs> when we didn't it was think six films at a time. Well, it was considered a little bit presumptuous to say, "I'm going to make this film, and we're going to do nine of them in a row, <laughs> and you're going to love them as an audience." Uh, back in the day, and I sound very old now, you know. You put everything into a film. You just said, okay, yeah. we're going to make... Uh, by the way, I think that's what people... I actually think that's what the studios should be doing more of now. It's just yeah. concentrating on one film, not saving things for, for later films. Because if you look at what we did in the Dark Knight trilogy, we always had a thought that, okay, if people love the first one, then maybe we'll get to do another. But we weren't going to save anything. And the reason the Joker isn't in the first film is because it was just such a great ending to sort of tease it in sure. that way. And it's amazing to think of now. But when we showed the film to the studio, they actually did ask, they go, isn't that a bit sequel bait? Are you sure you want to do that? I mean, can you imagine a studio saying that today? <laughs> and, I, and I was going, no, it's not about sequel bait. It's because it's just, you want to imagine these characters living on. It's just exciting to walk out of the theatre thinking yeah. about possibilities. Um, and it would have been too much to try and get the, the Joker in, but coming to The Dark Knight, we knew, okay, great. We get to do that now. We get to see that character in, in this world, and that's exciting. Um, but there was never any talk of not doing Two-Face or saving him for a third right. movie or whatever. It was all like you, you put all your chips on the table with those films. And so we wound up making three. We'd sort of loosely, very loosely talked about possibly doing three right at the beginning, just myself and David Goyer and Jonah just throwing ideas around. But then we immediately took it off the table and said, okay, let's just make a great movie. And we did that, you know, all three times. Uh, the one thing about, you know, Dark Knight Rises, we didn't know at that point we weren't going to do any more. But beyond that, no, it was about just trying to make the best movie possible. We, we were talking about the, the wonderful ending for Dunkirk. I'm just curious for the ending for Dark Knight Rises, which, again, was such so satisfying to me mm. in, in, in the way that, again, you kind of like tease a world we'll probably never see again. But like you open the mind up to possibilities mm. in terms of handing that baton to your kind of – Robin-ish character mm -hmm. and even the last image of the, the rising platform, which echoes, of course, the title. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit of sort of like when and how that, that last image or that or the ending of that film arrived uh, for you? Was that something that you came upon early on? So I'm just having to think my, back, my way back into <laughs> Dark Knight Rises press. Uh, <laughs> no, the, the ending uh, was really the first thing that I brought to the table that I had in my mind. Um, and for me, that is very important. It was the same with The Dark Knight. Like, I had to know what the ending was to feel that we could do a sequel. And I think that is the difference um, in today's world. Is that there's so much pressure for trying to make the best movie possible. No, the, the ending uh, was really the first thing that I brought to the table, that I had in my mind. Um, and for me, that is very important. It was the same with The Dark Knight. Like, I had to know what the ending was to feel that we could do a sequel. And I think that is the difference. Um, in today's world, is that there's so much pressure for sequels. There's so much pressure for IP and the continued exploitation of it. I don't think anyone is really allowed to stop and ask, okay, but can we? Re where does it really go? Does it really right. add something? You know. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because, for me, when I look at those films, and I'm very proud of those films. It's not for me to make any great claims for them, but I am proud of them, and I'm proud of the way that each of them comments sort of on each other and. I think, I feel like more filmmakers should have the opportunity to grow with the audience. And that's what we got to do. We took 10 years to make this film. You know, so yeah. we weren't having to try and decide what an, an audience wanted out of a third film while we were doing the first film. We got to, you know, we got to change and grow and, and you know, learn from the audience in a way, not, not in a reactive sense, not in a direct sense. But just in that you get older and sure. you change and you get to put that into the film. And so the films kind of grow with you and they grow with the audience. And I think that was fun. Interesting. It's something that the last guest on the podcast was Matt Reeves actually oh. who had a similar kind of experience I think in Apes in terms of kind of like evolving with that franchise. Yes, yes. Um, And those last two films are remarkable I would say. Um, do you have any relationship with Matt or are you curious about sort of what he's going to bring to that that character? I don't. I, I've never had the, the pleasure of meeting him. Um, I very much like what he's done with the Apes movies. I haven't been able to see the most recent one because I've been working, but I, I like the second one a lot. And yeah. I like the first one. And I think actually I've been sitting here pontificating about it, but I think that franchise, they have been able to do that a little bit. Absolutely. Take a bit of time, kind of think about, okay, if we're going to come back to it, what do we bring to it? And I think that makes all the difference.